Um, and so item number one is to discuss highlights from DHCD one year action plan. And I do have a few follow up things from the last meeting, but I will save those for last. All right, great. Yeah, so um, we are, let's see, our last meeting was, I think, May 18th around there. Um, and we held the public hearing to hear from the public, review priorities. Um, and we were kind of operating in that limbo state where we were like, we're uh, gearing up as if the grant might be due in the fall, but knowing that DHCD had indicated that they might move it to March. Um, and so we just a few weeks ago got uh, confirmation that it is indeed their plan to um, have the grant be due in March, uh, March 3rd to be specific. Um, it's still technically like a, a proposal, but um, my our program rep is saying it's very, very unlikely that they would uh, uh, not follow through on their proposal. You know, it's more or less what they intend to do. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I'll just, just the, the highlights of it. It's um, the grant would be due March 3rd. Um, it's a also unique in that it's a 24-month uh, grant. Um, so it really spans 22 and 23 um, grant cycles. Um, whereas like I, previously we had, you know, issued a grant you know, annually and it was an 18-month implementation window. This would be basically cover two grant uh, cycles. Um, and ask, what, does that, what does that mean as far as as I think about budgets that the um, you know the applicants are are grappling with? How, how does that impact their budgets? Mm -hmm. Well, so it, it's also they are doubling the amount of funds available. Um, so it's basically just everything times two. So um, you know, pre previously the, the total grant was $825,000 um, for the mini entitlement communities. Now it's uh, whatever, two times that is 1.65 million um, total. And- And is that but, still among just five organizations or can we do 10 organizations? Right. So. Yeah, the, the proposal is still that it's uh, five limited to five social service organizations and three non social service projects. Um, there's a, they're, they're having like a public here, the state's holding a public hearing to hear, you know, feedback on the the one year, pl the, 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 the plan for 2022 and Nate and I, we were, that was planning, that was going to be our suggestion is that they, um, you know, allow additional social service applications. Um, and, and maybe even more importantly is the non-social service projects because um, it would be, it, I think for, you know, I'm thinking for the town, especially like to come, it's hard enough for us to come up with projects that are in the, you know, uh, you know, 200, $150 to $200,000 range because we have to have all the, you know, construction documents ready and projects ready to go. And so to, to then say, oh, you actually need to come up with, you know, projects that are in the $300,000 range or $400,000 range, you know, that's a, that's a much bigger project that, you know, we're, you know, we have some things in mind, but we're, we would, I guess we'd almost rather do more projects for a smaller amount than a few like really big projects. So, you know, we'll see, they might not change their mind, but I think that's, that's our one, you know, point that we would like to make at the public hearing. Hopefully they would be open to that. Um, I think other communities are in a similar position. So. Ben, <clears throat> just it's hard to wrap my mind around exactly how the timing works, but um, just in terms of continuity. So to take an example of, you know, we've been funding for a number of years now, the Survival Center Food Pantry. Um, will this new schedule leave any gaps or will it be, you know, kind of seamless if they're successful, you know, from one 
cycle to another right. two years? Um, so that's a good question. Let me remind myself the contracts that we just signed. So yeah, the contracts that we just signed for the current grant go from June 1st of this year. So just a few weeks ago through May 31st of 2023. Um, so if this grant is due in March, then, you know, we probably wouldn't have an award until, you know, early summer and then contracts up and running until maybe, you know, late summer. So yeah, there would be a gap, um, maybe, you know, up to, you know, three to maybe six months, um, which definitely is an issue. It's also an issue for, uh, cause my, part of my salary and part of uh, my colleague, uh, the admin assistant Pam is covered by block grants. So we're, you know, luckily we're, we're in a, in a town setting where we can fill the gap, find other ways to fill the gaps. But um, yeah, the timing is not ideal for, for both the admin part of it and for the the continuity for the for the uh for the agencies and so that's going to be you know something we have to let people know is that you know um there will be this this gap so although if they're working on the same sort of fiscal year basis uh, there might be a kind of cash flow gap of a few months but if it's you know if we can award you know the entire amount that you know that continues or whatever um in that fiscal year it might just be back end loaded right but they're also not supposed to budget assuming that they're going to get the grant right right because not every, i mean obviously not everybody right, right. So. but just but I, you know, I, mean, going, I just wanted to like make sure there wasn't like you know a, like a full year gap or something that'd right. be really awkward yeah. like, well, what do we do yeah i wouldn't expect it i mean I would expect them to have a reasonable turnaround on, on the grants and get, get contracts up and running um, by late summer. But yeah, I don't think it would be, I don't think it would be much worse than that. Um, is the state just generally behind on a lot of things at this point? <laughs> um, yeah, my sense is, well, so I think with the, uh, with this in particular block grant there, and you guys probably know this better than I, but I guess the, this has always been the schedule. It's like March due date or, or somewhere around, you know, early winter. So they're trying to get back to that um, schedule. I think it better aligns with uh, fiscal years because in theory they, they would, you know, they, they're saying that they would have contracts up and running starting July 1st, um, which is their goal, but I think that's ambitious. But um yeah, but in general, yeah, that there has been a lot of turnover at DHCD, and they do seem to be a little bit. They were definitely behind on processing the past two years' grants. So, um, yeah, I think I think DHCD in particular may, may has had a little bit of some struggles lately. But okay. Um, but yeah, that's basically the the overview. There's a few other things. Um, in the action plan that are important. One is uh, they're putting a bit more emphasis on just um, planning and public outreach, um, which we do a great job of anyway. Um, but uh, they want us to refine our community development strategy, which um, I don't know, Nate sent me the one from 2018. I don't know if that's, if there's a more recent one, but uh, he said it's supposed to be updated every few years, so maybe it hasn't been updated since 2018, but they're um, expecting an updated community development strategy, um, which is, you know, it's just like a three, a three pager um, that kind of goes through category by category, you know, housing, land use, economic development, natural resources, kind of how we're doing outreach for those things and kind of a synopsis of like, what does the master plan say about this? What does the housing production plan say about this? And then, you know, using that to, to then justify um, the, the projects that we're supporting um, when those come in, so. And whose um, responsibility is that? Uh, collectively ours or yours? 
Um, yeah, no, I figured I would start like uh by just amending or editing the the 2018 one and then I can share a draft um and maybe get feedback at like our next meeting or something like that. Um, yeah, as I as I look through it, my first reaction was, well, this looks like it's above my pay grade. This might be something that the you know town council might be right, you know. Right responsible for uh you know setting the direction for the town but yeah yeah no i can definitely um truthfully I, i've only started looking at it today just to kind of figure out there's still references to the select board and town meetings so like <laughs> update even just updating those and you know putting in new newer up-to-date numbers for census information and you know housing production over the past four years so i think even just updating the information in here will, will be a good start and then you know the, the substance of it will kind of be the next step is you know what are we actually saying are, are the priorities but, but those wouldn't be something that we're i mean to nat's point those are things that exist somewhere right we're not determining what the priorities are yeah it's kind of a synthesis of okay. of other plans that have been developed yeah. anything else to do with uh number one um no not at the moment might, something might come up if I think about it, but nothing at this point. Then when did you say the public meeting is or the public hearing on when the decisions might be discussed at least about how Oh, they just announced that today. It's um it was a Friday. It's like the first Friday in July, maybe. Not the first, but yeah, I think it's the eighth. Yeah, there it is. Friday, July eighth at ten thirty. I can send folks the link if you're if they're interested. No, I was more just wondering what or it seems like it would be important for us to know that as we are mm -hmm. determining. I'm just looking at your schedule that you had sent to us or sort of a proposed schedule that mm -hmm. we would want to have that information. Before right. We're, hopefully we'll have it before we have any kind of a public hearing. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. I know because um, that was the other thing too, talking to our program rep, he said, uh, well, he said, you know, while it's, he commended us for having a public hearing in May and said, you know, it's, it's great that we did and heard from the public and got the ball rolling. He said that his, at least his supervisors would expect a, a, the, a, the public hearing to be held like once the action plan is finalized for um, the next grant because you know and, and to their point there can always be little slight changes you know they might put a bigger emphasis on you know one priority or another or from, at the state level so um, it's good to have you know all the information available to us once to in order to hold that hearing so um, in my rough timeline I, I, I was like I, I assume they would have that released by August but um, so that was my intention. All right. Um, do you want to talk about the preliminary timeline for the application process? Sure. Kind of yeah. Know when everything, how long everything needs to take from the moment that the RFP goes out and all of that. But there we you go. said you do, you do know or you don't know? No, we. I mean, those of yeah. us have been on the committee know. Right. But. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I'm I uh, invite feedback on that because I um, I guess I was kind of shadowing Nate the first two times and maybe wasn't as um, aware of exactly, you know, the different steps that were happening. But um, so, you know, the March 3rd is the application due date. I guess I'll, I'll start from kind of where we are now, just thinking that over the summer, we would um, finalize the timeline we're doing now. Um, think about the target areas, um, this uh, community development strategy that I was just referring to. Um, and then, yeah, assuming 
DHCD has finalized the action plan um, in late August, we would have another public hearing similar to what we did uh, last month to establish priorities and also review that community development strategy. That, that was one thing they had in the action plan was there needs to be a public forum that includes a review of this strategy. So that'll, that'll serve that purpose. So, you know, if that's in late August, I think I could then take the next month to, you know, finalize the RFP, um, incorporate any changes that emerged, um, you know, in incorporate the community priorities. Um, so if I issue it on September 30th, uh, give uh, applicants uh, basically the month of October um, to respond. So I think, you know, four or five weeks should be sufficient time to get the application prepared. Um, I try to, you know, be conscious of holidays here. So trying to get, um, so for you guys, you would get the applications on November 4th, um, have two weeks to kind of review them, put together some any questions. Um, on November 18th, you would send those questions to the applicants and then let's see we would we're now in the thanksgiving time of year so the applicants would have let me, let me just look at my calendar here so november 18th they basically have because the next week is the week of thanksgiving they would basically have two weeks after thanksgiving to respond to the questions uh, that brings us to december 9th um and i was trying to get to a point where um at some point in December, the THCD is gonna release the application um, for the, uh, the, the grant. Um, and this struck me as a little peculiar because they then in the action plan, they said they expect to have a, a list of all the activities that we wanna fund um, within a week of them releasing the application. Um, because basically, and oh, I guess it doesn't have to be all the ones that we want to fund. It has to be like all the ones that we are considering. So at this point, it's just the the activities that have been submitted, because um, they like to do a uh, just a, a, an initial check of like, is this does this meet the criteria for um, the block grant overall? Is it you know applicable? Um, it's kind of just a, an initial check. So ben. I was trying to get yeah. Does activities mean organizations? I don't know what quite, what does activities mean? Oh yeah, so activities means it's not organizations necessarily. It's like, it's like the survival centers, like in, entire food pantry, like uh, um, project, I guess, or, or operation or, or the literacy project doing um, adult education. So okay. it's- Okay, so they, sort they, of they, our categories yeah. almost. Yeah. The kinds of things are, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's both the kinds of things, but also um, they get into just like, you know, how are they serving low moderate income clientele and how, you know, are they meeting these, you know, criteria to make them eligible for block grant funds? Um, so do we just give them a list of who has applied? Yeah, basically we just send them a list and then like a probably like two or three sentence description. Um, which I think is submitted as part, you know, the, we asked the applications to do like a, a very short description. So we, we would just package that up. Um, and again, this is, at this point, it's still every application that's submitted. It's not the ones that have been prioritized yet. So, um, so December 9th, applicants respond to questions. And then this is where I was a little fuzzy. So I, I, I wasn't sure. So you guys will have received responses to your questions by then. Um, and then is this the point where you, you know, sit down again with the applications and review them carefully and rank them and, you know, fill out the matrix and all of that. Um, Cause I was thinking then, you know, we would have the month of December, the rest of December. And then um, about, you know, two weeks after new year's, to uh, to make those um, rankings and evaluations, and then we would have the public meeting where we discuss the recommendations. 
um, and and kind of get a first glance at how the projects were were evaluated. So does that kind of stretch seem logical? But I think there needs to be a um, I think there needs to be a timeline after December 9th. Yeah. So applicants respond to questions. Um, and then I think that we need to, so we're gonna, we're gonna ask questions, they respond on the 9th, and then we need to make a timeline between their response and um, when we have to have all our scores in. Does mm -hmm. that sound right to folks that have done, been through this with us, with me? Yes. Yes. Because there needs to be time before the January 12th meeting mm -hmm. for Ben to compile right. all of the scores. And in the old in the old and in the before days, we used to, you know, come together um, to talk about the scores and everything. I think before Ben compiled them, if I remember correctly. Nat, can you back me up on that? No, I thought I thought that uh, we just submitted the scores, um, and then uh, once we, you know, got those back, then we were able to sit down and meet to make the recommendations. Okay, you're right. Okay, okay. I just remember that's my recollection as well. And then yeah, mm -hmm. I just remember being at the Bang Center and being in person and having a, a discussion in public. Okay, yeah. So I think there's a date that needs to be in there somewhere. Um, okay. That the, for the deadline for the committee to submit their scores to you, Ben. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that can be, I assume, probably after New Year's, even. Yeah, I would. So, you know, even um, a January. week before a week before January twelfth, maybe. Like, give enough yeah. time. Yeah. And then oh. the public meeting. I get confused about the difference between a meeting and a hearing. If there is mm -hmm. one, I assume there is one. <laughs> um, because there is one meeting where the applicants essentially make a pitch to us mm -hmm. based on the applications. Is that the public meeting? Um, so I apologize. I have to run upstairs for a second. I okay. hear that crying. Yeah. Um, the public. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I have these flipped around. I think the nope. the public meeting is where it's more you all just discussing, and you and public comment is at the discretion of the chair. Um, the public hearing is like a you know advertised throughout the town and posted fourteen days in advance, and that's when it's you know very much the purpose of the hearing is to hear from the public. Um, so. You know, I, I could see it going, going going both ways. Is it does it make sense to have that? So it's so going to be swapped. No, my, right. my 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 recollection, and, and Gail, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I thought that um, what um, I think Becky was referring to as kind of being um, the, the pitch meeting. I thought that was really where the public hearing um, was to, to establish priorities. So even though it's ostensibly to establish priorities, it always seemed like a kind of pitch thing where the various organizations would kind of pitch their priority. Uh, but then my recollection was that um, once all the applications were in, we did the scoring and then we met, then that would be a public meeting, but you know, not a hearing. And that's where we would all get together, look over the scoring and make all the really hard decisions. And then we would um, make the recommendation to the town manager um, but then only after that point, when everything was announced that this is what the, you know, the recommendation is, um, then there would be a public hearing on that recommendation, even though the decision was already made and we would just sit there and listen to, you know, people, you know, react to it. I, I, I think you've got it. That's, that's it now. You got it. So I think it looks to me like the 12th and the 19th are flipped. Is that kind of... Well, so so that the twelfth is public meeting to make the you no know, what are determine the recommendations, and then the next one would be the public hearing um, to for, com for comment. Yeah, for, yeah, comment comment on the recommendations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after the decision is made, yeah. people can say, "That's great, thank you very much. Yeah. It's really important," or "We're really disappointed. You didn't, you know." 
Yeah, and they're similar to, we've done this before too, where we have a public hearing that's, you know, maybe an hour long and then we'll go into a public meeting format. And so there could be an opportunity for, if you're like, wow, we heard from a dozen members of the public who berated us for this decision we made, maybe we want to reconsider a recommendation. So there could be an opportunity to, to reconsider um, after this public hearing. Um, so I'm sorry, so is, I guess I'm maybe just blending meetings, but I could have sworn that there was a meeting after the applications come in where every where the applicants come and present and where we kept saying we've just assumed that we've read everything you know what we're looking for now is information that's maybe you know not in the application but that you want us to know about the organization like there was a a pitch I, but i think what happened was that to streamline I think you're right, Becky, but I think in order to streamline things because of COVID, that's when we introduced this question period, because when I first initially joined the committee, that's how it worked. And then we decided that we would have, um, so we get the applications in hand November 4th, we read them for two weeks, we have time to get questions back to Ben, and then that's when folks that's when we have the opportunity to express, we didn't understand this budget or you didn't list your board correctly. And then they get back to us. So I think that that's how um, it's so the having them come in person to do that, to address questions. Right, but I didn't mean that question. I meant, I just remember there was a specific meeting and I remember the one thing I wanted to know from every organization was how is this different from what you already do? Mm -hmm. And I had to ask that of each organization because they had a different thing that they were presenting. And I'm just trying to, so I, we'd already read everything and we were hearing from them about their applications. I, think, I, I remember think that, that meeting as well because it felt like they were not giving us anything new. Yeah. And I think right. you, Becky, kept trying to clarify what we were trying to get from them and right. it was almost to no avail. Right, no, and I remember it because I felt rude the whole time because I felt like I kept interrupting people, but it really was just the one thing that I wanted to ask. And so that's why I'm trying to, but we definitely had read the applications already. At that right, point. yes. And, okay. and we weren't looking for new information like, oh, we didn't understand this part of your application. It was more like, okay, if you're here to talk to us, give tell us something that we don't know already from having read your applications. Mm -hmm. I think there was two question scenarios that we had. We had one written and right. one verbal. And this is this shows the verbal, the applications respond uh, or the committee ask questions. That's the verbal, but we have written um, questions that we submitted that I don't think is on here. No, no, I think that's, that's not how Ben explained it. Okay, I think the November eighteenth is us asking questions, which then get written. That's not a meeting. That's just so us that's when the meeting. questions are due. But then we, but that's not a meeting. But there was a meeting that we had. And that's what you're saying. Correct. Right. Where we didn't like the questions we asked via email, we then got responses back that were written. Yeah, they, there go, was, through yeah. Ben. they go through Ben. The exactly. response. Yeah. The applicants respond through Ben, right? And then Ben. Right. Just mm -hmm. the and then we them. use that information to do our ranking, which we submitted submit by January fifth, and then January twelfth, we hear from the organizations. And they tell us what they want us to know. And then the 19th, we have every piece of information we could possibly have. And that's when we discussed and made our decisions about what we were, what, what, who we were going so to There should be them. another meeting between November 4th and December 9th somehow, is what you're saying. No. No, no my, I'm saying that my recollection was that either the 12th or the 19th meetings that are on here in January, one of those involved people telling us information they wanted us to know. And then the next one involved us with all the information, just talking amongst ourselves, uh, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be helpful to have that question and answer and that information prior to making rankings? Because what if we then wanted to change our rankings based on the information we received? Like if they didn't clearly state a priority and then we decided, wow, this really should be prioritized. Yeah, that's why we don't give the rankings until after we get the question answers to the questions. Right. So what I did was I had sort of preliminary rankings as I was developing my questions, and then I get the 
answers to the questions and finalize my rankings. Mm -hmm. But there should be another meeting sometime before the 12th is what is I think, because after where we talk, is not what you're, we're getting, or you're saying the 12th then, because we've already, so the, the committee members submit their evaluation should be after the 12th then. That's what I I think, but I don't know. I haven't been on the committee. No, before. I'm agreeing with you. No, I just I, yeah. I thought there was another meeting in the midst here, and maybe it's just that the twelfth and the nineteenth are sort of a double. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of those guys should be moved. Or like the twelfth priority, then the fifth priority, then the nineteenth priority. Like yeah, kind of like problem? that because the, because we did have a question after we got the 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 we did have a, 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 a where we talked to the people who submitted the applications after the questions but before we made our decisions correct so that's like what i think the january 12th right meeting. right right exactly so that that's be the the january 12th meeting. and then the january 19th meeting is when we convene and just talk really amongst ourselves about but we hadn't done the rankings yet by the by the what by the 12th yes we have we have that, done it by the fifth scenario. No, I know, but in the scenario that we're talking about, oh, yeah. what, we didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. do the evaluation rankings until we after we had talked to them about the questions. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so almost like we would have January 5th be a meeting, January yeah, 12th Yeah, you just switch the date to the 5th or the 12th. I see what you're saying. I, I mean, that seems what-, what uh, that, that is Xander what I was saying, saying too. too. And that yeah. makes a lot of sense. And I remember having that, where we did, you know, we had people come on and pitch, but it was mm -hmm. after the questions. I'm pretty sure. Before, I would just be worried before, that I that someone would want to change their ranking after yeah. hearing in person Q and A. Right. Yeah, that and makes sense. Yeah, I I don't know. And you can, and you can, because that's what it's for. And then after we hear from everybody, we can discuss and opt to change our rankings. But hopefully, between the um the completion of the applications, the question and answer period, there shouldn't be that much new information that gets entered into the process. So, but we I don't think we've ever changed anything after the hearings, but it's just to be transparent about everything. Right. And also Suzanne, just to clarify, um, the rankings are like a starting point for conversation. We don't, we didn't use the rankings as, okay, this one scored the highest. And so that's definitely who's getting, you know, yeah, and they're not public. like just a, a place just, for us to start yeah. a conversation, basically. Lucas, what were you gonna say? I was just saying they're not public. They're just what we submit to each other and sort of where we try to sort of come to a consensus on, mm -hmm. you know, sort of what we want to do and that, it might have been the same. It might have been actually the same meeting that we came to consensus after hearing the pitches. Yes. I, yes. Yeah. That's the hard, that's the nice part of it. In my head. Sorry. I, this is a long time ago for me. I'm I'm trying to come back to. That feels like it. I mean, maybe you're right though, but that feels like it's a really long meeting. It, it is. Was. Hearing from everybody, and then we're having our discussion about. Yeah, but you limit. Here's the deal with that meeting. Right. It was like a you three limit. Minutes. You right. limit um, each organization to maybe like two people so there are like six yeah. people there to talk about the survival center right. what we do is we go through each organization once and then if somebody has a second representative you go through twice and then you cut it and you give everybody like three minutes so mm -hmm. you can't have six folks from one organization getting up and giving a spiel mm -hmm. it becomes redu redundant anyway yeah. yeah how much can you say right um I was just going to say, I was, I've been digging over here. I found the meeting minutes from June 2021, and it kind of laid out the timeline for the summer, last summer that we did. I'm just copying and pasting from the minutes here. So we, this was from, I think, last summer, where we, uh, committee questions, August 6th, applicants respond August 12th. And then there, yeah, there's a public meeting to make recommendations and then the public hearing on the recommended activities. So, so, maybe, like it's, so maybe it's just the language we used in the proposal for this time frame is what kind of confused everybody. Mm -hmm. Because one said to make recommend meeting, to, the meeting was to make recommendations and then was the hearing on the recommended activity. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I think that, that helps a lot just to cut yeah. and paste from before. 
Yeah, well, that was a busy August, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even even before COVID, it was a pretty tight schedule over like the Christmas, New Year yeah. holidays because the RFPs were due like right before Christmas. And then we would have a couple weeks to look at them and very early in January, you know, have the rankings because at that point we weren't even doing the questions and we decided, well, we really needed to kind of do some follow-up and get some questions answered. So we added that, but, right. um, but yeah, it, it, it has in the past been a very condensed uh, time schedule. Mm -hmm. It's always the busiest time of the cycle and then it kind of slows down for the rest of yeah. the year. Okay. So does this seem like it, it, we can be, this can be the, uh, I guess, tentative schedule. Um, or is there any more clarification? It's pretty reasonable, not not too rushed. Yeah. And so, yeah, it looks good. It's well, also we, kind of a better time of year too, you know, yeah. um, a little bit better. And so would you think tonight we should set a, a late August date and just know that if we haven't received back the final information from, you know, regarding number of organizations and, and all of that, that we would then postpone the meeting? Um, I think it makes sense. I'm going away for a bit in August. So I think it, there's uh, yeah, limited time that it, we could, but I, I think it makes sense to schedule it. Um, So this would be for the late August public hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to be gone actually from the Monday the 15th through the Friday the 26th. So basically two weeks off, um, which I guess that gives us three days in august so maybe yeah maybe it's it's thursday september 1st i think that, that could be we could do that when is um is that the thursday before before labor day is the fifth yeah maybe we worry about people being on vacation not I us but from the organizations Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the RFP is not going out to the end of the month, to end of September. So everybody's kind of back in there post vacation, settled in from vacation for the RFP to go out on the 30th of September. Um, it just feels better because in the, in the old days, we used to do it like by end of December and it was like fiscal year end for people and it was challenging. And schools start August 25th, so most people should be back. Oh, that's that's good. Yeah. Okay, so we good for this timeline? So do you want to set September 1st? Is that what we're talking about? For or, this public hearing, yeah. Yeah, or the 30th? Can we do a Tuesday, the 30th? Does that work for people? Uh, I That 30th isn't good for me. The 31st would work. I'm just thinking because those we get closer to the weekend, people may be making it a longer weekend. Right. If the fifth is the holiday. Yeah, really anytime that week. Um, yeah. The 31st I'm, is good for me. I'm open all that time. That weekend is bad. That's it. <laughs> so we'll say the 31st. Is that right? Sure. That yeah. Okay with me. Sure. Great. Um, sorry, I'm just making a note of that. So we're saying public hearing on Wednesday. I'll have to get used to that Wednesday block grant meeting. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think that that works well. And then that, um, 
we'll have that public hearing and then that gives us a month to get the RFP ready and put that get that out the door. So great. Sounds good to me. Um, any other questions, comments about the schedule? Um, I guess the other dates are, you know, January 12th, January 19th, that's far in the future, but um, we won't really need any meetings per se during the fall, it looks like. It's mostly just going to be email back and forth with uh, applications. And during that time, is there any necessary follow-up from um, prior grant cycles? Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Maybe at some point we would want to do a, a check in or a review of the current activity. So that would be the, the 20 the current grant that that just got started last week or two weeks ago. Um, I, I, yeah, I feel like by the fall it would be a good time to do a check in, but um, we don't need to schedule that now, but OK, maybe sometime in just want to factor that into your schedule. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. We good with number two with the timeline and the application process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, number three, review target areas, review review criteria, and um, community development strategy. Should we wait yeah. on that until we get information from the state? Yeah. I mean, it seems like we sort of had a preliminary discussion, but felt like we didn't have enough information. And now it feels like we're sort mm -hmm. of in place. Yeah, we can. I I, uh, I just put it in there in case, you know, just um, if we did want to discuss it. Um, I can just show you what this community development strategy looks like, just to give you a sense of. Um, it's a three page document, basically starts again it's 2018 uh an overview of the town and the you know public participation 60 standing boards and committees which is pretty unbelievable um and then it basically goes through each category so it goes through housing talks about the housing production plan and kind of the different needs that have been identified uh community services um yeah, just uh, basically a lot of it basically just mirrors the community priorities, uh, you know, homelessness, homelessness prevention, youth development, land use. Um, that's mostly about zoning and gr growth and development, economic development. Um, Basically, it talks a lot about the university uh, and just the need for, you know, partnership, working with, with the bid and other stakeholders in town, cultural resources, open space, transportation. I can send you all this to look at it more carefully. Um, so, so given that um, Lydia Vernon Jones gave a pretty impassioned mm -hmm. um, speech at the last meeting and we were going to bring in Stephanie Trello, the climate person mm -hmm. in town. Obviously, that's something that feels to me mm -hmm. like it needs to be included in this. Um, yeah, I know. I'm surprised there's nothing about sustainable community development here. strategy. Yeah. Of course, yeah, this was five years ago, too. So, yeah. Whether it's, whether it's climate or kind of anti racism, um, you know, the new public safety, I can't remember exactly yeah. what it's called, but um, Cress. Cress, yeah um those things would not have been yeah a glint in the eye back in 2018 right cool yeah i think that makes a lot of sense i i uh, can definitely add in sections about that both uh climate and sustainability and then racial justice and equity and didn't um, we actually add two um target areas don't we have five target geographic areas or no uh right now i don't know why have, i thought that this is the latest iteration of the target areas map it's it's still three okay thank you looks like people died there and they outlined their bodies <laughs> <laughs> fun, yeah 
Only two of them. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think uh, as we, uh, you know, maybe later on after the public hearing in August, we could look, think about looking at this again. Um, I did want to ask folks if uh, you, how you feel about the survey and um, if there's any need or to reopen the survey now that we're kind of pushing back the um, clock a little bit. Uh, you know, I got a hundred responses, mostly <clears throat> from the, through my outreach through the superintendents, <clears throat> excuse me, through the superintendent's office. <clears throat> so, you know, I would have, I wanted to get more than a hundred, but um, I feel like I exhausted most of the outlets that were readily available, but, um, you know, I could do another push to, to get it out there. Um, there's no way in the survey to know whether somebody's done it more than once, right? There might be, because you do have to register for like mm -hmm. this Engage Amherst tool. You have to make a username. I only say that not that somebody would, would mean to, but I just feel like, like we get a survey and it's like, oh, I'll fill that out. And if it's the kind of person who does surveys, they would likely be like, oh, I'll fill this one out, not realizing they'd already done it. Right. But I do think- can you, omit, it, can you omit the respondents from um, the subsequent- push I think I could well I think there's a way in the back end to look at the usernames of who's responded so I could sort by username and then just omit any duplicates it's my I, I, it's hard for me to see how it's really going to be you know very different I mean if mm -hmm. you know you did the outreach that you could and we got the responses um you know there's not that much time that's passed it's hard for me to see like you know why it, it would be different and you know also i'm kind of concerned about you know the, the more we do it the more people's eyes just glaze over if they see oh they're doing this again so I, i'm a little bit hesitant to do it more than once a year if you know we want people to kind of see it focus on it and you know respond seriously but that's mm -hmm. just my initial reaction I guess I have a little bit of a different reaction, which is that um, I was surprised by how many people at our last meeting didn't were unaware of the survey. Um, so even though we felt like we did everything that we could to get it out there, um, I mean, all most organizations have a mailing list, for example, and it would might mm -hmm. be something that we could ask or give them the opportunity to include the link to it in their mailing list that goes out. Um, you know just to sort of expand that that the reach of it um mm -hmm. to that many more people and maybe even figure out a way to make it available to people who use the organizations not just the, who are on their donor list i would also be interested in um, seeing what people had to say more in the fall than maybe the summer uh, the world is uh, changing rapidly mm -hmm. Good point, Lucas. Uh. Yeah, I mean, one, um, I, I do remember talking about this a few months ago about the survey was the uh, idea of using the agencies to send out the um, survey. Just, you know, some obviously some of them have much bigger mailing lists than others. Um, and just wanting, I think we consciously didn't do that at first, just to try to make it more from the community rather than the, the agencies sending them out, um, sending it out to to their, you know, supporters, I guess. And again, I, I feel like it's, you know, it would definitely help us reach a lot of people who are interested in, in social services and, and, and support the work of the committee. Um, which is good. I guess I just worry about uh, it kind of skewing things, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that's going to necessarily be as representative if, if that's the publicity. Mm -hmm. I think though that there's a lot of overlap in who's yeah. probably on the list, but I mean, both in terms of who's maybe on the list and who has given money to, because anybody who's going to give money 
at some point is going to be on that list forever. Um, and also a lot of overlap in the consumers of the of what the organizations are offering. So I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, I obviously I I understand that issue, but I I guess in the end, it seems like the more people who mm -hmm. understand what's going on in Amherst who have a feeling about it and can give some information. It's not like we're bind, you know, binding ourselves to what they say, but we're just using it as a guide as and you know as community representatives to have something to go off of. Could could we go old school and leave a pile at Amherst Community Connections because folks come in there and are getting help in person because they don't own a laptop if they're living behind Big Y or folks that are taking the bus to the Amherst Survival Center for either a takeout lunch or to get a food box once a month, maybe give it to the pantry coordinator or at lunch. I mean, it would the work would be on somebody to tally those results, but it feels like the people that most need the services might not have the capacity to access mm -hmm. the information to make their voices heard and their voices only get heard through the staff of the organizations. And those are the folks that we hear from all the time. So it sounds retro because it's paper, but I'm just thinking about reach. And if, and, I'm, and my other, that's my comment. And um, my question has been, why are you dissatisfied with a hundred? Like what, what was your ultimate goal? Mm -hmm. What were you thinking about? And so oh, that's just I'm more interested about <laughs> because how, we're, uh, that is how we should be framing this discussion. Yeah. Oh, just because I'm competitive, and I think when you ran the survey a few a year ago, he got like 200 responses. I think so. more is better. Yeah. What is the percent? I don't know how, what what percentage of our population is that. A hundred. Um, we're at about 38,000, 36,000 or so. Um, but uh, so yeah, not not a whole lot. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not even. Go ahead, Rika. I don't know. That's a really tiny percentage, right? To to make a lot of conclusions. I know. I would say, I, I you know the paper thing is an interesting idea. I think um, there's certainly then no user name or anything, right? I mean, then you're just, I mean, whoever does it. I don't know. I. I mm -hmm. We do ask if they're an Amherst resident or not, um, so that could narrow it down. Because I think we we want to make sure we're mostly hearing from Amherst residents. Also, um, not not to you know, I mean, I know Ben is competitive and wants you know a lot more responses and everything, but but you know, just the big picture, the way I see it is that you know these responses are great to help us, but basically. You know, we're on this committee. It's our job to try to understand what the town is about and what the town priorities are. And so we have to use you know our own judgment as part of that too, what we think you know the town wants. And it's useful to me to have that input. But on the other hand, because you know 100, even 200, even 500 might not at all be representative, we still have to apply a lot of our own judgment. So it's helpful, but you know, it's really not, you know, sufficient, you know, in itself to, you know, substitute kind of, for, you know, what we think the town is about. Um, so you know, I guess I don't want to put too much work on Ben to, to, you know, try to get to 500 or a thousand or, or whatever, you know, paper or, um, but that's just my perspective. I agree with that perspective, and I guess I see the survey as being actually a way for us to learn information that we wouldn't otherwise have from the community, because otherwise, right. here we are, however many of us there are, right, seven of us just sitting in our houses making some guesses, so the more we can learn. Totally agree, yep. Better. But yep. I mean, obviously, we have no idea who's filling it out, so mm -hmm. there are limitations. 
so I think we could discuss this and go around and then go around and go around again. And for the sake of time, I think that what we should do is just table this discussion. I'm not, I'm, I'm rolling off the committee. You guys can all do what you want, but until August, because nobody's going to respond to anything now, it's the summer. And I think wait until people are back and um, at their desks and in school. And then if you're going to send it out, you're not going to send it out to September anyway, when people uh -huh. are here so table this discussion until august and at your august meeting bring it up again and see where you are and how you feel mm -hmm. yeah i guess the only consideration is uh, i i agree with you gail the uh um so and you guys probably know this better than i when the the survey is to develop the community priorities and the, those priorities are then added to the rfp correct so we're like we want to solicit you know mental health services food pantry youth development this that homelessness prevention um so i guess the when we issue the rfp we'll want to be uh in either in, you know just i don't know if there's any priorities that we would add so i feel like we have a pretty solid list and there wasn't anything in the survey that was like oh you you didn't include this um but i'm wondering if there's any we would consider removing, and I, and I think we would want to decide that um, after, you know, before the RFP is issued on September 30th. So I guess we would have some time um, in the late summer, early fall to, to figure out if there's any changes we wanted to make to priorities, but. Well, and Ben, is the paper option something that's doable or is that, would that just make your job impossible? Because I don't think there's probably much of a difference in who's using services over the summer versus not. Mm -hmm. um, and some of us um, are our desks all summer, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> right, yeah. I think uh, as long as I'm not expected to translate anything, because uh, that takes a lot of time. Um, if it's, I think it's easy enough to print it out um, and you know, bring them over to the various agencies. I mean, I don't. I don't and I wouldn't leave them there all summer. I would say you have to have a finite amount of time because yeah, it's dribbling in and dribbling in and you just say, okay, just pick two weeks and could you really by August 1st or whatever and then, yeah. Yeah, and, and put them out there for two weeks and that's it. And whatever comes back in those two weeks, that's what you have. But at least you've, you've put forth the effort. You found a different, um, a different means of gathering the information and then you can mm -hmm. feel um that we can feel like we've really expanded our reach so uh, that's mm -hmm. what i would do i agree yeah and i i think uh hopefully i mean it, uh, in theory it takes like two to four minutes to fill out the survey so hopefully someone could just do it right then and there and we don't need to you know, track down people who brought it home and then want to bring it to town hall or this or that. Yeah, no, and I, just, I think you I, just yeah. you just lean on staff at the organizations. You send them a memo. Yeah. We're putting this survey out. If you don't mind collecting them for us, the, it's, it, the deadline is this and it's information gathering. It, that, mm -hmm. that, that's what we're trying to do so we can have a, be a better informed committee. Mm -hmm. And then just it's lean- It's the tabula, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, no, no, go ahead. It's the tabulation I'm wondering about, not not getting the surveys. It's like compiling the data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> student you intern. Someone to... Student intern. Ah, great. Okay. <laughs> is that what can, is that can... an option, Ben? Um, probably not. But how about I can give you each uh, a few surveys, and you can each enter some. <laughs> I have an intern. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Um, ah, no, okay, I, it shouldn't be that bad. It, it's a few multiple choice questions. Okay. And then, you know, uh, I guess the only thing would be uh, just having to transcribe someone's, uh, um, if they're, if we do, if they do do an open response answer and answer, exactly. look at their handwriting and blah, blah, blah. But I think, I think that my priority would be to get the open response or sorry the multiple choice yeah thing, okay the rankings there and then work on the open response but i think it's i think it's worth the time i think the again the, the block grant dhcd is putting a bigger emphasis on community planning and outreach this year so i think they'll smile that we did a survey at all but then um uh 
even more appreciative that we you know did outreach directly to agencies and use paper copies as well. I, I might, I would recommend maybe you just have the multiple choice with only one open response and right. even have the option to reopen the online because somebody might say, I'll take this and then maybe have the link at the top of the page or whatever, if you want to do this online, if they don't mm -hmm. want to do it at that moment, if they're just going to pick up something at the survival center and getting their you know meal for the day, they, they might have five minutes. They might not have yeah. even that limited amount of time to fill out a, a quick multiple choice. So they might want the option to do it online. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. But I, I don't, that's just more work for you, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, uh, and now I'm leaning towards, I mean, it's opening, reopening the survey and then um, also, you know, doing this in paper copies, but then also um, having agencies distribute it to their supporters. Um, I don't see a huge harm in doing it, I guess, unless folks are concerned about it kind of skewing results. But at the end of the day, they're still Amherst residents and they're involved and support these agencies so and i think too you know it might be interesting like you know supporters of the literacy project you know also have things to say about you know homelessness and you know needs for for food as well so you know all these things are connected okay all right so the so the plan is to move forward with this but not until August, correct? If somebody's keeping it. I mean, then you should just pick a date that you would want them back by. Yeah, yeah. The two weeks before then mm -hmm. you know, for doing the paper ones. And if right. you can let us know when the survey goes live again online, just send the link out to us. I'm happy to repost it on social media and okay. you know, get out as much as possible that way. Sounds good. All right. Great. Number four, use of CDBG funds for sustainability initiatives. Is this in response to Lydia Vernon Jones's appeal at the last meeting? Yeah. And is that um, given that we fund social service agencies and capital projects I'm not sure how sustainability initiatives can enter into the conversation, you know, or into the mix. I know. So let's hear about that. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's tough because I think the uh, the block grant program is a little bit constrained in, you know, its its initial scope is from, um, you know, slum blight slum and blight redevelop or removal from the you know. 50s and 60s and then it's evolved over time to you know still focus on housing um, remediation but now has this focus on social services as well um, but it I feel like it hasn't quite caught up to the you know climate emergency that we're in and the imperative for sustainability um, and, and uh, uh, what's your name Ms. Vernon Jones last time, she brought up a few examples of block grant funded sustainability initiatives. And I, I looked a little bit more closely. There's a, there's a special program uh, for, it's called, it's called CDBG dash like disaster relief. And it's specifically focused on um, communities that are recovering from like hurricanes and, and climate induced storms, wildfires, I believe. Um, and it's a specific pot of funding for like climate related damage. And so it's not um, really for sustainability initiatives per se, um, or at all, or at all really. But, you know, I guess that was, that was a push for the Biden administration, I think was to allocate funds, block grant funds specifically for disaster recovery. Um, and, it, you know, and I looked at their website, HUD is like, oh, look at us, block grant is now supporting su supporting sustainability blah 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 and i'm like well not really um the two places i would see that it would impact us is on the community development um 
sorry, the, yeah, the community development strategy uh, mm -hmm. that I think having them have input on that is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then for us, probably it would be food waste, which is oh, yeah. uh, actually a significant um, contributor to um, global warming. And I think that is something that people like the Survival Center and other people could address. We also talked about it, I think, um, just around the public service projects, right? Yeah. And that we were going to have somebody come and talk about Amherst's, um, I mean, whatever the foundation is that we, or the, you know, the environmental impact mm -hmm. of public service projects or, or whatever is required in our um, contracts around that. Yeah, so it's kind of a, a overlay on top of everything else. And so there might mm -hmm. be various proposals to do different things, but okay, how does your proposal impact sustainability and, and climate change or um, how does it address it? And it might be, well, it's not a factor or it might be, you know, this actually is helping address climate change or whatever. So it's, it's a useful kind of overlay lens through which to look at them. Right. Lucas, what was the other thing you said besides food waste? I'm just trying to take notes. Just the community development strategy. Oh, the um, yeah. Have the, to update. I think yeah. that, yeah, for them to have input on that would be, I think, pretty cool. And even even the infrastructure stuff, you know, it's like, you know, what types of materials are we using? Um, you know, mm -hmm. different materials have different kind of climate, you know, carbon. Uh, impact so mm -hmm. so I, didn't we decide that we were going to have somebody come and talk to us yeah it yeah. was Stephanie Chicarello from the right. climate person in town I have that right. note yeah. yeah they have to volunteer to do it though <laughs> was that the issue yeah <laughs> Ste Stephanie is uh, one person who probably does the job of like three people in our town I, 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 I did I did have two good conversations with her about it but I didn't I, she has so many evening meetings and has a family and I just didn't want to add, add any more to her workload but um you know we had a good talk about the uh, uh and I, sorry I should have sent it out but the the town the ECAC that's the energy and climate action committee um that kind of de they developed the town's like climate action and resiliency plan um and that, that's probably been published for about a year now. Um, and so the, the, the CARP, as it's called, Climate Action and Resiliency Plan, the CARP has a lot of different strategies in it. Um, so um, Stephanie outlined a few, you, you know, a lot of them are very technical, but, um, you know, there is a push for to try to specifically look at, you know, low income housing and, and rental units in town and try to, um, you know, find ways to subsidize energy and energy efficiency improvements uh, to those buildings specifically. Um, and so we talked a little bit about, you know, what that would look like in terms of a block grant project. Um, and you know, it, it's tough because um, it's, you know, if, if it was the Amherst Housing Authority, you know, that would be, it's a, that's a public agency, it's public housing and it's all, all affordable subsidized housing. So that, that would probably be our best bet because otherwise it's, you know, a private developer would be, you know, we'd have to enter into a lot of contracts with them and, and it would be a little painstaking, but the Amherst Housing Authority, we could um, work with them on, you know, energy efficiency improvements to their buildings. Um, it's not quite like the exactly what Block Grant is looking to fund. It's usually they're doing, you know, new siding, new housing, or sorry, new roofing, that kind of stuff. Um, but we would have to basically make the connection that those energy and energy efficiency improvements are directly benefiting the residents. So ideally we would want some sort of agreement that it's, you know, reducing their utility costs directly. And it's not just the housing authorities, you know, um, still going to charge them the same for utilities or something like we need, we need to show that there's a direct 
Uh, Would there be any initiative to put solar panels on any of these spaces and with an agreement through the town or the utilities? Mm -hmm. or, you know, I, I don't know, but I mean, of course, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Right. The savings can be passed on to the tenants and not just for the Amherst Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'll ask Stephanie about that and, and Nate also specifically about that. I feel like there might be, you know, it, it's not quite considered housing rehab because we're it would we would have to find a way to call this housing rehab. That's like the our our in kind of to to for this um, type of project. And so, you know, we could, you know, for example, uh, Watson Farms they they're doing the roofing project from last year. You know, we could um, say, you know, you have to, or maybe for a different project for the housing authority, you know, like do this roofing project, but also make sure it's, you know, PV ready, for example. Or, um, but I don't know if the actual installation of solar panels would be considered housing rehab, which seems like a big missed opportunity in my opinion, but. Um, I also thought sort of what we were talking about was not necessarily that the project itself would be specific to with, a sustainability focus, but just understanding that it was something that we cared about in looking at the overall project itself of the, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the materials were being used or, you know, I mean, sort of that piece of it. So right. not that we're asking for a solar panel project, but what, how are, you know, what materials are they choosing over others as they're doing that and, and making mm -hmm. that sort of the application. So I, my, my understanding from our last meeting is that we were looking to sort of know what kinds of questions to ask and what kinds of information we would want to know in looking at the public service grants going forward around climate issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that was sort of my understanding. It was sort of like, how do we, how do we focus the lens of sustainability as we evaluate projects? Right. That's for both, for both the social services and for the kind of infrastructure yeah. project. I mean, yes, but I think that we all sort of understood that for the social service, that's not, it's not really yeah. what their yeah. focus is and we wouldn't ask them to create you know, that that should be a priority. It's more of the larger building type projects. How do we do it? Mm -hmm. And I think the speaker from last week also, or from last meeting also is, you know, it's, it's the advice, the committee isn't the one putting forth the application. So it's not like you guys are. Um, right. And that's why it was just information yeah. that we would, yeah. would have as we're reading, not mm -hmm. about asking for certain kinds of applications. Right. It's it's exactly what Rika says. It's the lens looking exactly. through these applications, looking at these applications through a lens of climate um, climate sustainability and are the, are the overall carbon footprint, you know, and all the other things that uh, Lydia had mentioned. So there's really, maybe that's something that we include in the RFP, maybe that becomes a, a line. I mean, you're not going to say create a project, but in your overall project, like Lucas said, you know, if you're uh, at serving meals at the survival center, tell us about what you do with food waste or expired food because they, they get food that's already expired. What do they do with it? Mm -hmm. But it's only going to be applicable to a handful of the applicants because what do brothers, big sisters have to do with, you know, right. they're, they're making matches out in the community. So it's a little tricky. I'm pretty sure there is, I think it's in the, I'm looking at the RFP now for this is for the non-social services. There is one of the criteria is um, consistency with sustainable development principles, which, you know, I feel like that's not, like, for example, for a sidewalk, we would say, oh, well, that supports walking and pedestrian, you know, activity and, and you know, and that's how it connects to su sustainable development principles. But I think the going deeper would be like, well, um, 
you know, what about the concrete that you're using? You know, that's incredibly energy intensive. And, you know, at the end of the day, there's still not a great alternative to get around concrete, but maybe it, it could at least start a conversation of, of uh, other materials to look at or, um, you know, really like, is, is there a way to really get the most bang for your buck with the concrete sidewalk, for example. And, and, and Lydia had mentioned that um, the town committee is working on a planet and climate plan. I don't know where that is in process, but if there happens to be, I don't know about a finished product, but even a draft, by the time the RFP goes out, you could include that information, the energy and climate, I'm reading my notes here, the, mm -hmm. plan, the planet and climate plan guidelines or draft or whatever it is in the RFP that goes to the social service agencies. So like you said, you're digging deeper and it's a little more specific, not just um, pulling things out of the air, but seeing how their proposals, those the, the RFP apps applications adhere to what the town's putting forth. So there's symmetry. Right, right. Yeah, I think, you know, as uh, for the town, speaking for the town, I think as we get closer to the uh, end of the summer, you know, we'll begin talking about different projects to put forth and we would definitely bring in Stephanie to help better understand, you know, one, is there anything that's project that's directly stems from this climate action plan that would be eligible for this or is there another project we have in, in mind that could also, you know, be be made more sustainable or, or have a more of a sustainability focus? So I think um, everyone in town hall, at least on my team I'm on, is is looking at it through that lens. Um, and I think we would also, you know, push the housing authority in that direction as well. And does Lydia Vernon Jones need a response? I mean, we kind of just listened to her at the last meeting. And I think somebody had mentioned like, you know, we get our instructions from DHCD and we're limited by what they put forth. And so mm -hmm. um, our hands are a little bit tied. So I don't know if she needed a personal response from you or, or not. And if you, or maybe you already got back to her. Um, I've not got, well, actually, no, I did get back to her and I asked her, uh, I put the onus a little bit on her. I said, you know, I really appreciate your your comments. And I said, I had, I've been looking, I spent like a few hours one morning just Googling everything I could think of to try to find examples of, you know, because Block Grant's a national program. I was like, there, there has to be a town out there that has found a way to fund some climate initiatives with Block Grant. But I, I, I spent a lot of time Googling and looking through various state and town websites across the country and really couldn't find any examples of projects of you know funding solar panels or funding you know energy efficiency improvements um so i asked i just i asked lydia in an email nicely i was like if if you have time and want to look into this a little bit further you know i think the the number one thing for us would be to find examples of projects that have been funded through block grant because then you know, we need to be able as a committee or, you know, I guess as a staff person, I need to be able to pitch those projects to the state um, if they give us pushback. So I want to be able to say, hey, look at this town, you know, in Minnesota or something that did did uh, did this project. Um, but I really couldn't find anything. So that was my challenge to, to Lydia. So good for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So are we good? Are we good with our discussion on sustainability? Anybody have any comments, questions? All right. Moves us on to public comment, but I don't think we have a, as I look at the number of participants, it looks like it's just all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And uh, other items not anticipated within 48 hours. Well, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Gail yeah. for, for years of, you know, leadership on the committee and um, yeah. I'm sure wish her all the best. We'll miss her wise counsel and uh, uh, in the coming meetings. I know that that um, it hasn't always been 
easy, but you know, being being the chair and having to you know enforce time limits and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but um, thanks for all the hard work you did. Thanks. And if I had a gavel, I'd hand it over to Becky at this point. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can give you my green marker. That's all I really got. <laughs> but, uh, no, I've always said that what I love about being on boards and committees is that you meet people you don't get to meet and you learn about things that aren't in your wheelhouse. You know, you stretch yourself. And I think that this committee has really been, I mean, there've been a lot of new faces that have cycled through. I think Nat's been with me the longest on this committee. So it's been, it's been really great and informative and it makes you open your eyes when you walk through town and you read the paper. So it gives you a different lens with which to see what goes on in town. So you're all gonna have a great time and go forth and be productive and stick to those timelines and don't be afraid mm -hmm. to shut it down. <laughs> and it's much easier on nicely, Zoom. very gracefully, Gail. Thank you. It's much easier on Zoom than it is in person. It was really mm -hmm. stressful when you're at the Bang Center. Oh my, but you know, it's a little bit easier on Zoom. Anything else? All right. I right. thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And thanks. I'm sorry I didn't get to shake people's hands and sit with you in a, a room together. It's been an odd, an yeah, odd yeah. sojourn. These past two and a half years. It's but... nice to sort of meet you. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Are we ready good luck to with your move? Yes. Thank good luck you. with your move. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. All right. All right. Take, Take care, care, everybody. Bye. 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 B